The Development of Meditation, Part 2, Amartana, 12 February 1962, Namo Tassa Pagavato Arahato Zumma Sambutassa. The words training ourselves in meditation just mean the training of our own heart. But in what state is the heart that it should need to be trained? Generally speaking, the hearts of most people are always conceited and obstinate in their thoughts and imaginings, all of which come from the heart. But people do not know how to cure themselves of their conceited and obstinate nature. This conceited and obstinate nature is very important, for due to its arising in the heart, it may lead a person to do evil things, or it may turn him into a good person if he knows how to guard and protect his heart carefully and lead it in the direction of virtue. Therefore, in this world, there are to be found both wise and foolish people, for those who are skilled in their own welfare have different ways of behavior from those who are not skilled. Their lives will be smooth and free from trouble, or full of troubles and difficulties respectively, depending on the way that their hearts have learnt to do things. This is very important, because of which the Lord said, Asaivana Zabala Nang Bandita Nanzasaivana, which means, Beware of fools, do not associate with fools. One should try to associate only with those who are wise and learned. Fools may be found both externally and internally. The nature of external fools has been partly covered already in the first of these two talks. But internal fools refers to one's own heart, which, if it is foolish, will lead one into bad ways all the time. If thoughts arise in such a way as to lead one into suffering and trouble, and to bring suffering and trouble to others, such thoughts may be called foolish thoughts arising from the sphere of the heart. The purpose of training and disciplining one's heart so that it gradually becomes freed from conceit and obstinacy is to change oneself into a truly clever person. It is, however, important to realize that in furthering the development of one's jitta to make it smooth and even, it must be put into training. When one's heart has received sufficient training, one will continue to practice what one has learnt, and one's work and life in the world will generally proceed well. If, however, one renounces the world and practices a higher level of sila tamma, moral behaviour, one's life will be smooth and harmonious in a similar way. These are some of the reasons why the training of the heart is most important. Whether one is foolish or wise, both states arise only within the one jitta, and not separately in different places, so that, as far as we are concerned here, training in gammatana is for the purpose of training one's own heart in the right way, and in this context, the right way means that the thoughts in the mind which flow out into bodily actions and speech shall be for correct purposes. When this is done, One's actions and speech will, in general, be aimed at promoting harmony and concord in one's associations with society and other people, by helping others and doing philanthropic actions, all of which will come about because one's heart has been properly trained and put in good order. There are gross fools, moderate fools, and subtle fools, and for this reason, the training which a person must go through in order to become a wise man has several grades. The grossly foolish person is the type who is liable to be fierce and angry-hearted towards his brothers, sisters, and close relatives, one who snatches and steals things, the type who generally goes about initiating trouble and anger everywhere. The moderately foolish person is of a similar nature, but he does not go so far. The subtly foolish person just has thoughts. Thoughts of envy, revenge, conspiring against others, and thoughts of anger and resentment of various kinds dwelling in his heart, but he does not raise a hand or speak against anyone. Sitting in meditation or listening to the teaching of Gammatana as you are doing at present is for the purpose of coming to see the right and wrong which arise from one's own heart. On the other hand, if one relies on one's own initiative, and wrong thoughts arise and remain in one all the time, and if one has no training and is unmindful, one will hardly be able to distinguish these thoughts which arise from the heart as being wrong thoughts. 
When one permits such wrong thoughts to dwell in the mind, letting them go in whatever way they like under the power of inherent tendencies, which arise from the heart without any restraint or hindrance, and when one has no interest in trying to watch and cure them or bring them under control, then thoughts of a wrong and evil nature will accumulate and dwell in one's mind all the time. Such thoughts may even be sufficiently strong to give rise to actions and speech which are wrong and evil. Therefore, training one's heart is of the greatest importance. For those who like to go further in the practice of Gamartana, there are more subtle levels of Tamma, much more subtle than the way described above, and these may be attained by the effort to train one's own heart to become calm and cool. With regard to a cool heart, it can come about by stopping the work of the heart, which means stopping the endless stream of thoughts about all sorts of things, by making the heart dwell on one or another aspect of tamma. This is a way to bring one's heart under control so that it stays with this aspect of tamma, or one may use a parikamma, preparatory repetition, which is of just the right kind to make the jitta stay with this aspect of tamma until one becomes skilled and accustomed to it, and one can supervise the heart all the time with mindfulness. Being thus constrained to dwell on this aspect of tamma with mindfulness will then cause the jitta to drop into a state of calm. When one's heart has attained calm, which means that it has become free from all things with the exception of knowledge alone, happiness will arise, and one will have the feeling that one's heart has both virtue and worth. A person who is unable to train his heart in virtue and worth up to the level where this becomes clearly evident to himself might think that external things are of more benefit and value than his own heart. It is for this reason that such people are excessively conceited and vain about material possessions and opinions and many other things. On the other hand, training up to the level where one can see the calm arising in one's heart, as described above, will bring about restraint and control of the heart, and it will make one feel that those possessions which one must have in order to live in this world are enough and are all that is necessary. In training one's heart to attain a state of calm, if one truly strives or is truly diligent, and if one has already developed mindfulness, one's heart will not be able to overpower the mindfulness which watchfully guards it, and sooner or later a state of calm is bound to arise in the sphere of the heart, which is at present conceited and distracted. The Lord Buddha, before he attained enlightenment and became the world teacher, also had the Gelesas, Tanha, and Asavas within him, in the same way as all of us. But the Buddha was able to overpower and completely eliminate these things, which were the enemies of his heart, until Buddha arose and appeared in the world, just because he unceasingly strove with diligence, effort, and attentiveness. Normally one's heart likes to gravitate down to a level or state in the same way as water always gravitates downwards, unless there is a pump to raise it to a higher level. In this case, the pump refers to such things as always trying to develop effort, patience, diligence in meditation, devotion to diligence, diligence in being watchful over one's heart, in saluting, in showing respect, in practicing the Buddhist chants, and diligence in having self-control. When one becomes used to doing these things, they become habits rooted in one's heart, so that one will continue to practice them. One will then come to see the results of them appearing and developing in one's heart. When the result of doing the above things arises in one's heart, which means that happiness arises, then truly one will have gained that which will lead one's jitta or heart steadily on to develop strong belief and faith. At this stage, one will have the means to attempt the development of a still higher level of calm in one's heart. In attaining a state of calm, the average person may be able to attain such a state for four or five minutes, depending on how he is used to it. But one who is really accustomed to the practice of samadhi and pawana can dwell in this state for several hours. The jitta which attains such a state of rest will manifest calm and happiness. It will let go of all those things which it is accustomed to think about. It will just be superintended by knowledge and mindfulness, and it will be free from all things of all kinds which trouble it. This is what is meant by the heart dropping into a state of calm. When it can attain such a state, one will begin to see that one's heart and oneself have virtue and worth, and that one is worthy of Buddhism. Generally speaking, however, 
People do not think in this way, and I would like you to know that the one who is giving this talk also used to think at one time, as many others do with wrong understanding, that all those things which make up virtue, gracefulness, and goodness are not the standard which one should live up to and practice so that personal gain and happiness may arise and develop until one attains the path, fruition, and nibbana, magga, pala, and nibbana, which is the highest level of tamma. The one who is giving this talk also used to think that these things were the standard or nature only of those great ones who have abundant merit, such as the Lord Buddha, and that they were therefore able to practice and attain a state of excellence and become special people. In other words, to become a Buddha or a Savaka, disciple of the Buddha. He also used to think that people nowadays do not have the inherent ability to develop themselves in this way, so it is not for them. When one still has not done any training, nor become deeply immersed in Buddhism, such thoughts can arise as they do in almost everyone, the reason being that one has not practiced or done anything. But when one endeavors and strives with true diligence every day, it is similar to making one's living, for a person must not just take a day off from work whenever he feels like it, as it would spoil his living and he may lose his livelihood. When, however, he works every day for the right periods of time, his work will undoubtedly prosper. He will be at peace having security and the consequent happiness. In a similar way, when one endeavors and strives to develop one's heart until one is able to work at it every day, or eventually in every posture, i.e. walking, standing, sitting, and lying down, one may be sure that one will attain the taste of the good tamma, sad tamma. In other words, Calm will arise to a greater or lesser extent depending on one's ability, provided that one practices enough for it to arise. When one has attained a state of calm and temporarily let go of the burden, happiness, faith, and wonder will be felt in the heart, because this state arises from the jitta which has let go of its attachment to objects of sense and thoughts. When the heart has experienced calm and peace such as this, it will have confidence, faith, gladness, and joy even after it has withdrawn from this state, and one will always know what it attained and the nature of the happiness that arose in the heart at that time. From then on, effort and diligence will greatly increase. As one goes on training in the development of calm, one may expect that the above state will arise more easily and quickly day by day, until the day comes when one will be able to sit down anywhere at any time and in any season and set one's heart to attain a state of calm as one wishes. This is what is meant by saying that one's heart has been trained until it has become skillful. Then, wherever one is, happiness will always arise from one's heart, and wherever one lives or goes, one will find that one has value and virtue and is worthy of Buddhism. One will be a precious vessel that is able to receive and retain the good tamma and the whole of the teaching of the Lord Buddha. In training the heart to attain a state of calm and coolness such as this, one may then ask, if I should die now, what world or state will I attain? There will, however, be no need to think about what would happen if one should die, for at the time that one attains such a state of calm, one will still be in the present, living on this earth as all other people do, but there will be a state of happiness in one's heart which will be sufficient assurance of one's future state if one should chance to die at that time. One will still go on living in a house or going about here and there as other people do in the world, but this state of happiness will make one feel that there is something wonderful within one's heart, which has come about by training it to attain a state of calm. Having attained a state of calm and coolness of heart, one will then have the potential or opportunity to examine, investigate, and see the true nature of sapawa generally, which means the nature of things which exist. The Lord said that sapawa is one's surrounding environment, and this may be divided into two categories, as follows. For one who is foolish, stupid, weak in wisdom, and strong in the ways of evil, all things become things which augment his evil ways. For one who is firmly established in the ways of sila tamma, moral behavior, as for instance, one who has gone a long way in the development of calm, all things become devices which teach the heart, so that it finds a way to develop and strengthen its calm from the things which make contact with it. At the same time, one may investigate and meditate by way of tamma upon the things which make contact with one in one's surrounding environment, so that one can derive benefit from them, as and when they come into contact with one.
Furthermore, it should be understood by those who practice meditation that the word calm is a word with a broad and general meaning, whereas the word samadhi means that at the moment when the jitta becomes concentrated together, it goes down and becomes firmly established. After the jitta has arisen and withdrawn from this state, the calm and coolness of heart which have been induced do not leave the heart together with samadhi, but remain there, even if one then thinks about things, using creative thought and imagination, or using one's mind to plan and think out things in connection with one's work. One may do all these things as one wishes, but they will not make one's heart turbulent or distracted, nor will it become attached or depressed in thinking about these things. This is what is meant when they say that calm is one's constant companion at all times. Thus, samadhi means fixing the heart firmly and unwaveringly at the moment when the jitta becomes concentrated and drops down. Or, it means firmly and unwaveringly fixing the heart so that sense objects, aramana, do not lead it into a state of agitation and turbulence, even if one then uses imaginative thinking. This is the nature of what, in Buddhism, is called samadhi. When samadhi has been developed as far as this, one will have the faculty to investigate the true nature of those things which are within oneself. One may contemplate dukkha, suffering, and there is no need to go elsewhere to look for it, for one can see it in oneself, for there is here a mass of suffering that one tries to relieve and ward off all the time. One may contemplate by way of the parts or the functions of the body, all of which are aspects of suffering. But one may contemplate these parts of the body within oneself in whichever way one finds suitable, by way of dukkha, as above, or by way of anitza, impermanence, in which case one will come to see clearly that they are always impermanent. Even those faculties which make up the nature of the heart in its functions of inventing, imagining, and thinking are also impermanent and unstable. For however strongly imagination and ideas may arise, they die away to the same extent as they arose. In other words, their arising may be great or small accordingly, but when they die away, their cessation will be exactly equal to their arising. This is when wisdom, banya, begins to get to work. If, however, one contemplates these parts of the body by way of anatta, one sees that when one has departed from this existence, at the pawa, these parts are called a corpse. And can one then take any of the parts of this body along with one? One cannot take even a single hair, for it must be thrown away and dispersed in this world. As for the elements, the tatu, when, after death, the body breaks up, the earth element becomes earth, and similarly the water, fire, and air elements return to their own natural state, all of which contradicts the view that there are such entities as animals, people, women, and men. After contemplating and seeing clearly with wisdom in the above manner, one will come to understand that what is external and what is internal are both of the same nature, so that contemplating external things will reveal the same as internal contemplation. In other words, the true nature, sapava, is the same both externally and internally, which means that they are both anitta, dukkha, and anatta in the same way. This is what is meant by practicing contemplation and using wisdom. When wisdom, banya, has developed enough to enable one to meditate in the above manner, then samati, which means firmness, stability, or calmness of heart, will become very strong. One will then come to great happiness, and will clearly come to see the danger and dread in the parts which are to be found throughout this bodily form. One will see that it is a mass of suffering or a mass of fire which always needs to be cared for and cured, or else one will see it as a thing which causes constant anxiety and worry. In this way, one will come to see the burden of it all. One will also come to see what really is the true nature, sabhava, of all those things which are around and about one. At first, when one sees the true nature of all the above things, one is sure to criticize them, although generally speaking, these are the things which most people love. When, however, one has contemplated and seen the true nature of them quite clearly with wisdom, attachment and grasping die away from one's perceptions, and one just has a clear understanding of them. But until one has understood clearly, one will, generally speaking, tend to grasp at things, to be doubtful, and to retain one's attachment. When wisdom has untangled and examined the true nature of the above things, seeing them absolutely clearly as they truly are, grasping and attachment will steadily shrink and withdraw, leading to a state of calm. This is when wisdom begins to get to work with skill. 
when one has dwelt in contemplation in the above way, what can there be to make one's heart tainted or corrupted? It will be energetic, very strong, and careful in guarding and watching oneself. Mindfulness will be strong, wisdom will surround one, and diligence will be present at all times. In seeing the danger and dread of the world, one will see much. In seeing the virtue of going beyond all suffering and torment and attaining freedom from it, one will see much. Everything which has been said above is concerned with the true nature, sapalva, of the way of material things which have been associated with one's jitta for a long time. For so long, in fact, that one is unable to perceive what things are dangerous to the jitta, and this is so because it has been mixed up with and has followed the common way of thinking and understanding in the world. The tamma, however, is not to be seen with the eyes of the flesh, but is to be known with the heart. In other words, with vedana, feeling, sanya, memory, sankara, thought, and vinyarna, awareness, each of these four being called a kanta. The Lord Buddha then taught that de sangvopasmosuko, the waning and complete extinction of these sankaras, is happiness. And this greatest happiness does not die away and depart from one. Ropakanta, the body group, is one form of sankara. And in a similar way, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyarna Kanta are each respectively forms of Sankara which are referred to in the above quotation. When one has contemplated and examined all these Sankara Tammas quite clearly with wisdom, in the way described above, one will be able to know all Ropa Tammas, form objects, with insight, not only one's own bodily form, but also external forms, both far and near, tall or short, large or small, and valuable or worthless, as thought by people in the world. One will be able to know all these things as they are with insight, and to let go and be free from them all. This is what the Lord called the ability to let go of this one kind of Sankara Tamma. The most important types of Sankara Tammas are, however, those which arise within one's own heart, such as imagination and thinking. The Lord said that supreme happiness comes when one gets rid of these Sankara Tammas, meaning the Sankara Tammas which are the cause and origin of oneself and which arise from delusion. When one is able to know one's own Ropa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyarna with insight, the waning and complete extinction of these Sankaras will mean the waning and extinction of the internal Sankaras by means of wisdom and the gradual extraction of Upadana, attachment. From where does Ubadana arise? It arises from uncertainty, falsehood, and dullness of the heart. In other words, from knowledge and a way of understanding which is under the influence of avidda, ignorance, and doubt. This causes one to grasp and become attached to things about which one has this kind of doubt, or conversely to things about which one has no doubt. All of this is due to the influence of avidda, which drives one into wrong ways, making one feel that this thing is good, I like this thing, I hate this thing. One has no doubt whether this thing is truly good or truly bad, for the heart believes that it is so, and this is called avidda. When one's heart has contemplated, untangled, and examined the sankara tammas quite clearly, seeing them as they truly are externally, and knowing them as they truly are internally, then there will be no need to make one's heart let go of its attachment to these Sankara Tammas, for it will let go of them itself due to this clear knowing and understanding, thus abandoning or renouncing them by means of wisdom, Banya. In the above quotation, it says that the waning and complete extinction of all these Sankara Tammas is happiness. In regard to this, the Sankaras which are one's own result are such things as one's robatadu, the elements which make up one's body. The sankharas which are one's own cause are such things as thoughts and constructive imagination, both good and evil, gross and subtle, all of which arise from the heart, and one may either call them thoughts or sankharas. From where do these sankharas come? They come from the dictates of avidda. When one investigates with subtle wisdom, searching until one penetrates to the basic origin of avidda, the place where it has established itself, what is it that one finds? Having penetrated to the basic origin of avidda, which is the same thing as the subtle kilesas by means of subtle wisdom, the state at that moment will be like a battle going on underground. 
In other words, if one still thinks that avidda and oneself are separate from one another, then avidda and oneself are sure to be constant enemies, and it is impossible to know which will win and which will lose. This is because avidda is the same thing as delusion, and it is oneself that is deluded, and the one who fights the avidda is also oneself. For if one has the wrong view that avidda is separate from one's heart, or that one's heart is separate from avidda, then avidda and oneself are sure to be constant enemies. When one's contemplation has reached this level and understood the above, the whole of avidda will be revealed by one's wisdom, and one will see that, in fact, apart from within oneself there is no avidda. It is just the whole of oneself that is deluded. When the meaning of this has been seen quite clearly, avidda disappears, and one becomes one who knows. Delusion is oneself as one is now. When one becomes one who knows, due to the power of wisdom, that will be oneself as one is then. Apart from oneself being deluded, delusion cannot be found elsewhere in the world. Apart from oneself coming to know, knowledge cannot be found elsewhere in the world. The result of one's investigation, penetrating and getting in amongst oneself and avidda, is that as soon as the avidda dispersed, the truth is revealed that avidda is not to be found outside oneself. As soon as one knows that it is oneself that is at fault, virtue appears and develops. As soon as one knows that it is oneself that is deluded, the one who knows appears and develops in the heart. Then one will come to the end of all questions and doubts with regard to such things as, Who am I? What is avidda, and what is vidda, for they are all oneself alone. Truly, then, one will be able to say that this is the waning and extinction of the sankharas, which accords with the tamma aphorism, daya sangvopasamo sukho. Furthermore, with regard to the cessation of those sankharas which exist by virtue of avidda, when the sphere of avidda has dropped away and disappeared, sankharas may still arise and be active as they did with the Lord Buddha after he had attained enlightenment, for he certainly used the five kantas to establish Buddhism. Throughout his life he had to have ropa, which was his physical body, also sankara kanta, memory, and the rest, all of which are known as the five kantas. This was so until the day that he was finished with them, and he entered Parinibbana. But these five kantas of the Lord Buddha had become mere kantas. They had become just the door of the jitta, without the arising of any gelezas, tanha, or avidda whatsoever. This was so because avidda had been completely destroyed by the power of wisdom, and the five kantas had become mere kantas, in which the gelezas and tanha would never again arise and appear. Therefore it was said that the extinction of those sankharas, which make up the Gelesas, Tanha, and Avidda, is the highest and greatest happiness. At this stage, when one spreads one's attention to the external sankharas, all of which are rupa, which may be large or small, broad or narrow, or however else they may be, and which also include sound, smell, taste, and things which contact the body, each of them appears as a normal sapava, thing in its own nature. If one then turns one's attention to oneself, one's rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, and vinyana also appear to oneself just as the respective sapala. None of these things appear as good or evil, nor in association with the gelezas, tanha, or mana, conceit, whatsoever, because the power of wisdom knows them as they are with insight. The most important thing which is also one's greatest curse and evil, is thus avidda within the heart, and this can be overcome and completely got rid of by means of wisdom. When this is done, there is nothing to create, construct, and cause originating sankharas to arise and lead to trouble and anxiety, nor to give rise to birth, old age, sickness, and death, and so on. This truly is what the Lord said, When there is no more avidda left, those things which are formations of arranged parts and functions, such as a bodily form, as a man or woman, or becoming in birth, old age, sickness and death, and all the mass of suffering and trouble in the future, cannot come from any of the remaining sankharas, for they can only come from those sankharas which arise based on avidda. When these sankharas have been extinguished due to the extinction of avidda, or when Avidda, the great creator and originator, has been destroyed, the remaining sankharas, which still exist as the five kantas, 
will be mere sankaras and will never again be poisonous and dangerous to the one who knows. Therefore it is called De Sang Vopasamosukho. With the destruction of the internal sankaras which initiate becoming and birth, and the clear knowing of the external sankaras, meaning the physical body, which is the result that one received from internal sankaras in the past, and this with the emancipation received from internal sankaras in the past, and thus with the emancipation from all sankaras everywhere due to wisdom, all the sankaras which still remain revert back to their normal state in accordance with their true nature and go the way of nature. Thus the earth element is earth, the water element is water, the fire is fire, and the air is air, and they are not attached to anyone, for they can only become attached to the heart which is under the influence of delusion, and which goes wandering about, initiating birth and becoming, forms, bodies, and sankharas. But these things are all resultant sankharas, and not causal sankharas, for causal sankharas are such as arise under the influence of avidya. When avidya has come to an end, the control over the sankharas is a mere control, just sufficient to expediently regulate life from day to day, and when the end of life has been reached, they break up and disperse in accordance with their own nature. The remaining nature, which is pure, but a sutti, is also free, vimutti, as it will have been from the time when this sabhava, this nature, first became pure. There is then no manifestation of anything which goes towards becoming in birth, old age, sickness, and death, nor anything which leads to the arising of further sankharas. And this is called Daesang Vopasamosukho. The fading away and ceasing of all sankharas is supreme happiness. The purpose of training one's heart is to get free from hindrances, obstacles, and all suffering and torment, so that one may gradually come to harmony and ease in one's existence. If one is unable to reach the path and fruition, Maggapala, which is the highest state, all the virtue which one develops here and now in this life will become a habit condition which will lead to becoming in birth that will be good and suitable for one's aspiration in the future. There are many different forms of birth, and if one has not developed virtue, one may be born in a situation which is both bad and unsuitable, and as far away from one's aspiration as the sky is from the earth. One should think carefully about this. At such time as the present, while we are all sitting here, one may look and see with one's own eyes that there are people of upper, middle, and lower class, the rich and poor, the foolish and clever. This is the way things are, and is there anyone who can alter us and turn us into the person that we would like to be? Not so, for these conditions arise due to the gamma which we have formed in the past. Therefore, one should constantly accumulate good gamma in order to attain what one genuinely wants in the future. The influence of this gamma is a thing of the greatest importance, for one has the right to make gamma, but gamma has the right to bring results back to one. When the results of gamma come to fruition, if the gamma is good, the results which one receives will be good, such as having plenty, being clever, having the influence of one's good habit tendencies, and having power and virtue of a different nature from that of other people who have also had a human birth. If, on the other hand, the gamma is bad, the results which one receives will be bad. One's physical body may be deformed, one may be poor and needy, and generally speaking, wherever one is born in this world, suffering will arise, flow in, accumulate, and remain there, in oneself alone, as in a cesspit, all the urine and feces flow in, accumulate, and remain there. Gamma is thus like Brahma Likit, which is said to wait always, to give us all our rewards according to our deeds, both to those whose Gamma is good and to those whose Gamma is bad. Therefore, one must try to train one's heart so that one will become a person who has the power of good habit tendencies in his heart. One should not, however, aspire to have the power of good habit tendencies for the purpose of commanding and controlling others, but only for commanding and controlling one's own body, speech, and heart, to make them do things which are virtuous, graceful, and good or else for the purpose of doing things to benefit the world and Tamma as one may wish. For this is far better than with those people who have no interest and never do anything in the way of Tamma. 
when one has the power of good habit tendencies very strongly developed, then one can attain Beisung Vopasamosuko, which the Lord Buddha did not keep to himself, for he laid down the Tamma as an inheritance for us, so that we could follow the way that he went, and so that it should promote the strength of our own good habit tendencies, until we can reach the ultimate point, which is Magga, Pala, and Nibbana, the path, fruition, and Nibbana. These three can then become the qualities of each one of us who attains this state, and then we will be radiant with the power of our own virtue and goodness. Therefore, apart from one's aspirations to attain freedom and nibbana, the most important thing is the training of one's heart. But if one still has not got the right aspiration and desire, because one's practice or the power of one's perfect tendencies, vasana barami, are not yet sufficient nor strong enough to enable one to attain freedom, one will still be destined in the future to have one or more births and lives which are smooth and free from troubles in whatever realm or world or within whatever country or boundaries one lives. They will be boundaries within which there will be peace and happiness of heart because the power of the Tamma is a guardian and protection. This follows the word of the Lord who said, Tammo hale rakate tamma zaring. The Tamma guards people who practice Tamma, preventing them from falling into evil. In saying that the Tamma is one's guardian, how does it guard one? To start with, one must at first promote Tamma. To give an example, this Mahamakut Educational Council building, in which we are at present sitting and listening to this Tamma Desana, did not come into being automatically on its own, nor by way of nature, but it arose due to the people who planned it and built it, and due to all those people who had virtue and merit in their hearts, so that when faith arose collectively in them all, they started to plan and build. In time the building was completed, and now it is the place where we are all seated in the cool shade. It is pleasant for us. The sun may shine or the rain may fall, but we sit at ease and need not worry about the conditions outside. This is the case with this educational council building, and it is also the case with our own homes which protect us in many ways. All these things exist because they have at first been made by us, then they become things which can protect us. In a similar way, one must, to start with, practice tamma and promote tamma, which means that one's own bodily actions, speech, and heart must be put into good order, one must develop calm, and one must generally follow the way of tamma in a relaxed and tolerant manner. By virtue of having promoted tamma in the foregoing way, one is then bound to be protected by tamma, and wherever one is born in the future, the influence of the tamma which one has built and developed by right training will follow and help one. Then one will be cool-hearted and happy in all forms of becoming and birth for the rest of the time that one must still spend wandering in the round of samsara. When finally one has the power of very strong good habit tendencies, one will be able to get free from the suffering and danger which are inherent in the round of samsara, and one will come to the dying away and cessation of all that which causes worry. In other words, all these sankaras can disappear so that one reaches the far bank of the river, which is Nibbana. In conclusion of this Tamma Desana, may the blessing of the Lord Buddha come to all of you who are the followers of the Buddha, so that you may have bodily happiness and well-being of heart always. Evang. Thus it is.